Good morning. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dan Bernier. Dan is the director of the Division of Park Environmental Sciences, which is within the Union County's Department of uh, Parks and Recreation. His responsibilities include managing the restoration of the deserted village of Feldville in the Wachung Reservation. Dan became interested in the deserted village at the age of 12. His family had often attended the semi-annual tour of the village that was presented by one of the village residents. Later in 1975, he planned and completed his Eagle Scout project in Wachung Reservation, a three mile long loop between the Trailside Nature and Science Center to the deserted village and back. In 1982, Dan started working for the county as a naturalist at the Trailside Museum. He is now the museum curator and the new leader of the semi-annual tours. Along the way, he also coordinated the writing of the master plan for the restora restoration of the deserted village, which is very pertinent to the talk today. Dan and his wife just celebrated a big anniversary it was 30 years ago yesterday that they moved to the deserted village as resident caretakers. Yes, on Halloween. <laughs> Dan now assumes the persona of uh, David Felt, Feltville's founder for the annual Four Centuries in a Weekend and Haunted Hayride programs. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dan Bernier, a friend and a fellow scouter. Dan? <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Thank you for the invitation today. I'm very happy to be here. I spoke to the guard apparently two years ago. And, uh, uh, you lost two years. It was COVID. It was like three or four years ago. Three or four years ago. Okay. <laughs> um, I was happy to speak then about the history of the deserted village and, and brought you up to where we are today. Uh, today's topic, we're going to review the history again, but we're going to try to talk more about what is happening in the deserted village now and where it's going into the future. The deserted village of Feltville, it's not really deserted. Um, it, it's amazing how many people uh, I encounter who are surprised to find out that my family and I live there. Well, then it's not a deserted village. No, it actually has not been deserted since 1882. And we'll talk about that as we get into the talk. Um, <laughs> How many people have been to the deserted village? Oh, quite a few. Uh, if you haven't been to it, you've certainly been past it. Uh, people go past on Glenside Avenue all the time. And it's amazing how many people just drive by. And it's quite some time before they say, gee, I really ought to go in there and see what that's all about. Uh, um, <clears throat> the uh, deserted village of Feltville is in the Watchung Reservation, which is the largest of Union County's 36 parks. Uh, the Watchung Reservation is three square miles and the deserted village falls right in the heart of it. The uh, story of what has unfolded at the site of the deserted village goes way back before the formation of the park, because the park is just under 100 years old, but we actually have four centuries of history in the deserted village area. The story begins with Peter Wilcox, an Englishman who uh, had originally settled in Jamaica, Long Island, and he uh, inherited some property from his father-in-law. So with his wife, Phoebe Badgley Wilcox, and their five children, they moved from Long Island out to this area. Now in 1720, this was the frontier of America. People didn't live here yet. They lived in the big towns like Elizabethtown, or if they were farmers, they lived in the West Fields beyond Elizabethtown. But Peter was a bit of a visionary and he knew that people were going to move westward, and that as they did, they would need lumber to build their farmhouses and farm buildings. So he, he built a dam, a low dam, only about five foot tall, down along the Blue Brook, which flows between the first and second Wachung Mountains. Uh, at a spot very close to this bridge that you're seeing in this picture, he built a sawmill, and he and his sons began to uh, cut down uh, the trees to, to produce lumber. He, he probably picked this spot because there was already a trail running through here, a Native American trail called the Oaxacic Trail. And it later grew up into a road known as the road from Westfield to New Providence, which still exists in many uh, places today. Uh, on the mountainside side, it's called New Providence Road. On the New Providence side, it's called Glenside Road. 
you've traveled that trail yourself many times. Uh, but here is where that trail at one time crossed uh, over the Blue Brook. The uh, stonework at the bottom of that bridge is still probably original back to the 1700s. So they, they had a sawmill, they were cutting down the trees from the forest, the native forest, and, and producing lumber and selling it to, to the early settlers of the area. Well, of course, as the Wilcox family cut down the trees, they ended up inadvertently clearing the land, which could then be formed. So the Wilcox boys then became farmers. And as the Wilcox family grew, um, different uh, sons moved out and, and got their own tracts of land all throughout the area. They continued farming the land for about 125 years until, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, there is a, a cemetery in the deserted village that is the cemetery of the Badgley and Wilcox families. Uh, the stone in the front there is Phoebe Badgley Wilcox, the mother of uh, um, the, the person represented by the two stones at the far end and her other four children that they had uh, with uh, her husband, Peter. Um, there is the stone for John. Um, in 1776, the colonists declared their independence from Great Britain. They wanted to get free from the rule of King George. They went to war to secure that independence. Many of the um, Wilcox boys signed up in the New Jersey militia, went off to fight alongside General George Washington. In November of 1776, John Wilcox in the New Jersey militia found himself in a place called Fort Lee up along the, the Palisades on, on the edge of the Hudson River, directly across from New York City. Well, the British overran an American fort in New York, and Washington knew that very shortly they were going to come across the river and overrun Fort Lee as well. So he ordered the evacuation of that fort. As the militia and the army fled ahead of the British across North Jersey, there were a lot of skirmishes, and we believe that John uh, may have been wounded in one of those skirmishes, um, knew that he was mortally wounded, had his will drawn up and, and died 12 days later and was buried in our cemetery. Uh, interestingly enough, none of the stones that we see in the cemetery today actually sit over the graves of the people that they represent. Um, John's stone is the only original stone there. The, the uh, Three others that are marble were placed there by the state of New Jersey in 1968 um, to honor veterans that were discovered to have been buried there, one of which is John. So John actually has two stones. Daughters of the American Revolution placed a stone for his mother, Phoebe. Uh, we uh, have, in just in the last few years, realized that the date of uh, her death as recorded on the stone, which is exactly the same as that on John Stone, is incorrect. It, it was probably a bookkeeping error uh, when her death was recorded at the Scotch Plains Baptist Church several months after her death, uh, probably at the, at the time that John uh, passed away. Um, so that stone is incorrect. She actually died in June of 1776, probably a week before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So the Wilcox family was in the area for uh, 125 years until along came David Felt. David Felt was a stationer. He had a stationary business. Now, that doesn't mean he stood still. It means he sold stationary product. Um, he had a, a very good business originally in Boston, uh, selling very high quality products. In fact, two of the presidents of the United States, Van Buren and Jackson, were getting their personal stationery printed by him. At some point, he moved his, his business down to New York City. He had a store. Uh, on Pearl Street in Manhattan, and he had a factory in Brooklyn. By 1844, his store was selling products faster than the factory could produce it. He needed another factory. So he came out to New Jersey and discovered the same thing that the Wilcox family had seen, that the first and second Watchung Mountains were close enough together to be able to build a dam to, to impound the waters of the, the Blue Brook behind it. Now, the Blue Brook is not a very large stream, but it, with a, the proper size dam, you could hold a lot of water. So he actually built two dams. Um, one was the primary dam for supplying water 
to drive the water wheel in his mill. The second was uh, further upstream. It was kind of an ins insurance policy against periods of drought. He could release water from that lake into the lower lake to keep his business going in the event of a drought. Uh, that upper lake still exists today. Uh, he originally called it Feltville Lake. Uh, today, we know it as Lake Surprise. Uh, this is a, uh, a lead casting of the seal of David's company. It was called Stationers Hall Press. The seal was actually found in the Blue Brook maybe about 30 years ago by a 12-year-old girl who luckily turned it in. It's now one of our most prized artifacts. David's Mill was a, a very large factory. It was about 125 feet long, three and a half stories tall. It was outfitted with all of the machinery he needed to uh, produce products. He was, he was in the business of printing. Um, he, he made things that other businesses need, things like receipt books and ledger pads. Uh, he also sold things like pencils and pens and ink. Uh, he did not produce paper. There's a misnomer that he had a paper mill. He, he did not have a paper mill. He purchased paper from other mills that already existed in the area, probably including one in Milburn, which you heard about last week, the paper mill, which is now a playhouse. Um, so he outfitted the, the uh, factory with printing presses and book binding machines and uh, everything he needed to make his products, but machines don't work themselves. He needed people to, to do the work. So he started advertising for help in the area that he knew best at that point, which was New York City. He ran advertisements like, like the ones you see here. Uh, it's interesting. He was very specific in, in who he was looking for. Like, for instance, Protestant women wanted. Um, not a lot of affirmative action in, in his advertising, but um, he brought people out of the tenements of New York City and the sweatshops that they were working in and brought them to um, this area to, to live and work for him. Um, of course, they needed places to live, so he built houses for them. Within two years, he built an entire town of probably 22 buildings. The houses were very simple. The uh, architectural style is called Greek vernacular, um, basically just boxes with roofs on them, no fancy adornment, no porches, just a stoop out at the front door. Um, the houses were uh, of two different sizes. They all uh, were built according to the same basic plan. By 1850, he had 175 people living in his town, working for him in a variety of occupations, and he had 11 houses to fit them into. So do the math on that, 175 people in 11 houses. In the There's three smaller houses that we'll see a picture of later. Um, he had two families living in each of those. The house is split down the middle with a, a doorway on either side, basically two rooms on the first floor, two rooms on the second floor. That would be for small families. Larger families would be in a house like this one. We are looking at the back of the house. All of the houses are, are kind of built into the hill. So the front entrance is really uh, up more at ground level on the first floor of this house. But I wanted you to see that the basements were full height, seven foot high, and therefore livable. So he could fit four families in here, again, by having the house divided down the middle. You see the central chimney, there were fireplaces back to back against that chimney at the at the basement and first floor levels. And um, he would have families living here that would be your typical family, mother, father, five children, or groups of unmarried men and unmarried women. He had a lot of young people, um, late teens, early 20s that he recruited to work there. And he often grouped them together in what I refer to as apartment units as many as 14 in an apartment with an older person of the same sex to watch over them. And it'll be kind of like the house mom. Uh, this building was uh, a, a key uh, gathering spot in the village. On the first floor was his general store. The, the people of that time obviously uh, didn't have the Blue Star Shopping Center to run off to to get their food or their clothing. Um, they didn't even have the means to be able to travel to somewhere like the Blue Star Shopping Center. 
They they need they relied on David Felt to to supply everything that they needed for their physical life. So there were 600 acres of farmland, all that land that had been cleared by the Wilcoxes. David Felt farmed that. Now 600 acres is one just under one square mile. That's a lot of farmland. He had livestock to produce meat. He had apple and peach orchards. All of the the produce would be provided to people through the general store uh, on the ground floor of this building. Upstairs in the same building was a church. He made people go to church every weekend. Um, he provided ministers of varying denominations. He was very strict in the way he ran his, his community. He was Unitarian. He didn't make people be Unitarian, but he wanted them to, to at least live a Christian life. And he had uh, strict rules. He had a bell that rang out every morning to tell people to wake up and when to go to work and when they could go home. And nine o'clock at night, the bell rang again and everybody had to be indoors. Um, he watched over his people. They had a nickname for him. They called him King David because he was, was so strict. Uh, all of the children of his village, question? Oh, okay. The, the question was, was this unusual for that day? Um, at the time, there were uh, utopian communities. Uh, this was not, it was not David Felt's intention to establish a utopian community. He just was trying to do right by these people so that they would work well for him. Um, we're gonna hold any other questions to the end though, because we will have a period for, for questions at the end, but I have a lot of slides to show you. So the uh, children of the village, as well as the children of the surrounding farms all came to school at this one room schoolhouse where he provided a teacher, Sarah Felt Toby, his niece. Um, this is a, a portion of Belding's map of 1850 of Essex County, which um, that area was still part of Essex County uh, at the time up until 1857 when Union County was established. And in looking at this, we see two lakes, the two lakes that, that Felt had bit, built, that larger one being what is now Lake Surprise, the uh, road that crosses the picture in between them right here. That's the road from Westfield to New Providence, starting down here in Mountainside and coming up and through and uh, out and on to New Providence and Berkeley Heights today. But down here we see Feltville, we see uh, we see Book Factory, and I believe this is Protestant Church. It's too small for me to see here, but uh, and there's the Feltville School. So there was a lot of stuff going on. It was an entire town. It was fully operational, taking all of taking care of all of the needs of everybody living there. Uh, this is an aerial view taken in 1927. I just wanted you to see how wide open things were. Um, this is the road. This is the road, Cataract Hollow Road, coming down into the village from Glenside Avenue, which is. It's, it's a little higher up here out of the picture, but as it's coming down, it comes past the first building, which was the building that David Felt originally built to uh, operate out of. It would be like a construction trailer is on a, on a housing development today. He threw that up real quick, reusing timbers from some older Wilcox houses. That's the house that I live in now. Here is the building that was his church and general store, and his road came down through the village and past the houses here, which are kind of hidden in the trees. But look at all this open land here, and you may see these rows of apple and peach trees up here in his orchards. Um, he, David had a, uh, a method of binding books that was new. Up until that point, most American companies were using a system developed in England and in use for probably centuries. David uh, developed and patented a new way of, of binding books. He was also, though he was not making paper, he was producing these marbleized end papers, these uh, you know, you know, multicolored pages that you see at the beginning, uh, the, the front and the back of old books. Life went well in Feltville all the way up until 1860. So David Felt was there for 15 years, but by then he was ready for retirement and he, uh, left the village as he was being taken by carriage uh, off to the train station at Murray Hill. He looked back one last time and said, well, King David is dead 
and the village will go to hell. And that's exactly what happened. Over the next 22 years, the property changed hands six times, six different businesses tried and failed. Uh, Felt sold to Dr. Samuel Townsend, who had a business making sarsaparilla, which is kind of like um, root beer. That didn't go very well. Somebody else used the farmland to grow tobacco. They had people rolling cigars in the in the old mill. That didn't go well. Somebody else was trying to raise silkworms. They brought in the ailanthus trees for the silkworms to feed off of. The silkworms never really uh, stuck, but the ailanthus trees certainly did. And that's what we are fighting now uh, because they're the primary hosts of the spotted lanternfly. Um, in 1882, the property was bought at public auction, uh, 22 buildings and I think 760 acres of property by Warren Ackerman uh, at a cost of $11,450, a tremendous deal. Ackerman had originally made a fortune in the uh, cement business. Then he made a second fortune selling vulcanized rubber to the United States Army during the Civil War. And... He invested a lot of his money in land. He had land all throughout Scotch Plains and all the way up into this area. He purchased up a lot of the property uh, that had been Feltville and he, he bought it for the purpose of, of really a hobby. He wanted to raise fancy cattle. He would use the old farmland as grazing pasture. He would use the old mill as his stable. But his friends convinced him to utilize the vacant buildings as a summer resort. And it was developed into a summer resort called Glenside Park. Here we see that dam that Felt had built as the uh, primary impoundment for the mill, but it now has a, a rustic bridge made out of cedar timbers over it. We see a lady there with a parasol walking across. If this picture was a little more clear, you would see right up this ravine here, this thing up here is a tower on that building that was the church. It's an observation tower that uh, Ackerman added to the building as uh, an extra activity for people to engage in. Um, he added some really intricate landscaping uh, around the houses. Here we see these rows of shrubs and high flowers. Um, he tore down two of the houses and built a much larger building in its place. This became the inn for the village. People could get meals here if they wanted, or they could have guests stay there. Uh, while they were in the village, they could en enjoy all kinds of recreational pursuits. There were two lakes for swimming and fishing and boating. There was horseback riding. There was uh, croquet. There was golf, baseball, um, tennis. The tennis court still exists today. Lots of things to do. Uh, here's an aerial view from uh, 1927 again that shows us more of the layout. Here's that Cataract Hollow Road coming into the village. There's my house here, the church store building here. And then we see the houses. There are three houses here and there had been five back here, but this one is the inn which replaced the two houses that had stood here. Here's the three smaller houses down at this end. And there is what by that point was the vacant mill and the garage that used to serve it alongside of it. The Blue Brook runs right, right down the middle of the valley here. Uh, but you can see that the land is all still open in the resort period because again, it's being used for things like, like playing golf. The resort was very popular up until 1916. Even after Ackerman died, his, uh, his nephews continued to run the business. But the, um, by 1916, people had that newfangled contraption, the automobile. They could go further away on vacation. They weren't limited by where the train would take them. So they started going to that new vacation hotspot, the Jersey Shore. And, and the resort closed in 1916. The property was divided up into lots, sold at public auction in 1919. But just two years later, the uh, Union County Park Commission was formed. And uh, they set to work forming what would become the fifth oldest county park system in the United States. And they started right away laying out plans for four parks, one of which would be the Watchung Reservation. They bought up all the land that had been Feltville or Glenside Park and incorporated it into their park. Well, um, in 
they leased back some of the uh, houses to a gentleman by the name of Edward Grassman. Grassman had been an engineer and surveyor in Elizabeth, who also dabbled in some other businesses, some with Latin American connections. And he also invested in a lot of real estate. He, he had this swamp land in North Elizabeth that wasn't worth anything until somebody decided to put in the airport on it. And so he, uh, he had some houses up here in what had been the, the summer resort that he used to entertain guests related to his business. And one of them he called the Mexican house. And he invited a Nicaraguan artist by the name of Roberto de la Selva to spend a summer there in 1927. Roberto was actually more a sculptor, uh, but in that summer he painted murals directly on the plaster of the uh, ground floor walls of the house all, all around, uh, about 12 large murals and several smaller ones. Um, they are very similar in style to the famous Mexican muralist Diego Rivera, and we have established a connection between the two of them. So those murals are internationally significant. Um, here's what the, the paintings look like uh, a few years back. Unfortunately, time has not been good to them. The, uh, the building has not been heated since 1975. Moisture is a, a, a constant problem with all the buildings in the village living, you know, as they do the buildings right in the midst of a, a forest that's constantly pumping moisture out of all the leaves of the trees. Um, but you see that the, uh, the subjects of his, his uh, paintings were varied. On the left, you see what's a, an Inca or Mayan god, and on the right, you see a bunch of people kneeling in front of the Virgin Mary. Um, here's a, a, a group of peasants uh, bringing in some crops. This painting is still in relatively good shape and will be the centerpiece uh, when this building is re fully restored as an art museum. So in 1929, the Great Depression hit and the Park Commission found itself holding all of these vacant houses at a time when people were losing their houses. They started renting out the homes to, uh, to people who needed them. And, and the village stayed pretty much continuously occupied since then. Uh, in the 1940s, during World War II, there were uh, a, a um, Glenside Village Residents Association. They had summer picnics. They had victory gardens. Um, they even had a, a, a newsletter. It was a magazine that they didn't publish it. They, they had people contribute. People from each house would write something, draw something. They'd bind it together into one book and then pass it around to all the houses. Um, the uh, residents uh, of all the houses continue until the 1960s. During President Kennedy's administration, he had what were called title programs. One of the title programs required that sixth grade students get an environmental education. So the Deserta Village became the Union County Outdoor Education Center. And the uh, former general store became the headquarters for that. A um, carriage house that Ackerman had built for his summer resort became the cafeteria and lecture hall. And as houses became vacant, they became classrooms. The, the problem with it was that it was a, a seasonal operation. They only ran classes uh, spring and fall. It became very hard to get a staff to, to keep it going. So by the 1980s, the Outdoor Ed Center closed. And after that, those houses that had been um, classrooms stayed vacant. As other families moved out of the, the other houses, those houses became vacant as well. At the time that I moved in three years ago, there were three families living there. But uh, today, there is, is only my family. Um, that brings us up to today, and I wanted to talk about where are we going with uh, the village today. In 1980, 1980 the um, Deserta Village, um, more technically known as the Feltville Historic District, was listed on both the state and national registers of historic places. In 1985, I was involved in developing a master plan for development of the property. Uh, that plan is what we are still basically following. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the parts of that plan. These are the three small cottages that Felt had built for his workers. Uh, the plan would be for the one on uh, in the foreground to be a residence. Uh, 
the, the attempt is to have three residences, one in each group of houses to keep an eye on things. But of the, of the other two, um, we'll see close up to them in a minute. The uh, plan is for programming in the village to center on archaeology. There's at least 75 known archaeological sites uh, that have been recorded. Uh, some of them have been excavated, but there's much more work to be done there. Uh, the county has been lucky to secure now at this point uh, six grants from the uh, New Jersey Historic Trust that have helped uh, to do initially stabilization work on all the houses in the late 1980s, and then restoration of the church store building in 1998, restoration of Masker's Barn, which was Ackerman's carriage house that was completed in 2011, and just recently um, some exterior work on two houses. Um, this is the house that I live in. Um, this will remain as the caretaker's residence. It is um, ideally situated as the first house that anybody has to pass on their way in. So when kids come in there at 12 o'clock at night, as often happens, particularly this close to Halloween, um, I have the opportunity to turn them around and send them back out. Um, this is the one of the three smallest cottages. Um, this house will be restored to look like a mill worker's cottage. It, it is still has the most um, of the original Feltville elements to it, including the two doorways. So it will be partitioned down the middle as it had been originally. You'll be able to go inside and see what it was like to live in a house uh, this small and only have half of the house as the mill workers did. The house right next to it will be restored as a summer resort cottage. The porches will be reconstructed and you'll see what it's like to have use of the, the whole house. Um, th this is one of the two houses that just had $900,000 worth of work done on exterior restoration. On this house, the uh, roof was replaced, uh, gutters and leaders were added, all of the windows and doors were restored, but the rest of the work is waiting for the next grant, which is about to be awarded by the Historic Trust. These, this house and the one just beyond it are in the, uh, along the main road. They will be used for temporary residence in a variety of ways. Um, you could rent it for a family vacation, no, it's not the Jersey Shore, it's not the Poconos, but for a family of limited means, it's a great place to spend a week, um, access to 100 miles of hiking trails, several lakes to fish in, Trailside Nature and Science Center, uh, horseback riding at the Watch on Stable, plenty to do there. It could also be used if a, uh, a business, a corporation is having a corporate retreat at Masters Barn, they could put up their executives here for a couple of nights. And there is a, a lot of uh, events at Masters Barn, including weddings, where the uh, wedding couple may decide to rent a house to use uh, first to prepare for their wedding day and then to spend their honeymoon, or at least their honeymoon night. Uh, this is the other house that was just restored. This is the house in which the murals were painted. Uh, this house got a full exterior restoration. Um, what's really neat about this house is the porch that extends down the side of it and around to the back. From here, you get an incredible view down into the valley of the Blue Brook. If, um, if this were before 1930, we'd be looking straight down at David Felt's Mill, uh, but unfortunately that was torn down in 1930 because it had become somewhat of a, a hazard for kids to roam around in. Uh, this is the general store and church, which was, was restored in 1998. It now serves as the visitor center. Um, there are museum exhibits in there. Unfortunately, due to staffing issues, which were complicated by COVID, it has not been open for about three years, uh, but we are looking to reopen it sometime within the next year. But at the same time, uh, we've recently been approved uh, by the county commissioners in their capital budget for installation of real professionally prepared exhibits that will help to tell the story in there. Um, to date, the county has spent about $6 million in the deserted village on restoration work. Hard to believe when you look around, you're like, where'd all that money go? You can't see all of it. Two and a half million dollars are in the ground. Uh, you see the fire hydrant in the front there. It, um, water is essential to operation of a village of this type. 
uh, particularly if you're providing public access. Public buildings have to have fire sprinklers. They need public restrooms. None of that could work off of the old well that we had there when I first moved in. Uh, fire protection is extremely important. Over time, two of the houses in the village have been lost to fire, so it's, it's of uh, primary concern. Um, I mentioned Masters Barn already, the carriage house that was restored in 2011 um, with the intent of using it as a lecture hall and a meeting hall. But the, the restoration came out so great, people said, gee, can't we uh, use that for parties? Here you're going to see some pictures of the restoration. You know, here it's being fenced off uh, as the rest restoration work occurred. Um, the uh, port co share, the overhang at the front had to be taken off to be reconstructed. But you can see, you know, that the building was not in great shape. What had been the big barn doors had been boarded up years ago. Many of the windows had been boarded over. During the restoration, they had to take the floor out inside and install 35 concrete piers and jacks and jacked the entire building up in the air. And it stayed up elevated like that for three months as, as the contractor dug out the old foundation, which was crumbling, poured a new concrete foundation and then put the original stone back on the front of it to give the appearance of the original, then set the building down on that foundation and, and then restored the interior of the building. And the interior came out terrific. Um, here's a, a scene from a, a recent party there. Um, as I said, people use it all the time. We host somewhere between 100 and 120 events a year. Uh, across the street from it is a pergola, a very uh, picturesque spot for people who are getting married. This is actually just this past weekend, as you can tell by the pumpkin theme. There's the bride and groom coming down the aisle. Uh, we have nearby a um, campfire ring for those scouting people in the room. This was an Eagle Scout project, one of the best scouting pro uh, Eagle Scout projects that I've worked with. And I've worked with, at this point, close to 200. Um, this was a, a scout from Scotch Plains, put a lot of engineering into what would seem like something simple, but it, it, in order to be long lasting, it's got a drainage system under it. It's got a foundation. It's, it's amazing. It's extremely popular. It's used at pretty much every party we have now. Um, there's a, a, a close-up view of the pergola, also an Eagle Scout project, actually from my troop in Elizabeth. That young man not only built the pergola, he also built two benches that are on the, the porch of the uh, church store. Um, and these things have been in use for at least 10 years now, and they're still rock solid. Um, here is the road that Ackerman was using to get his cattle from the farm fields down to the mill for stabling. That stone wall along it was probably built in 1882. That has been restored once by an Eagle Scout and is about to get some further work by a, another Eagle Scout. We got a lot of work, uh, as you can tell, done by Eagle Scouts. We've probably had 20 projects done in the deserted village over the last 30 years, uh, including this. this the, there are six apple trees here in what is essentially my side yard. We had them planted to help interpret the fact that David Felt had apple and peach orchards to feed his people. Uh, the intent is for, uh, as these trees get older, to be able to use the apples to grind them into apple cider at one of our annual events. Uh, we have a, uh, a lot of ways of communicating the history to people. We have two kiosks, one at the parking lot and mid one midway down through the village. Through that, we make available this self-guided tour brochure which I have copies of on the table over there if you'd like to take one with you. How Lyndon in the TV commercials used to say, read more about it. You can take one of these home. You can also scan a QR code at the, uh, the kiosks or you can get it directly off of the county website. There is also a booklet available that tells all about the, the murals that Roberto de la Selva painted. You'll find that in pockets on the two kiosks. We have a series of 15 interpretive signs throughout the site that have a lot of great graphics and text that explain each of those particular sites that you're looking at. There, there are audio tours where you can um, pull this up using the QR code. And then as you walk around the village, you'll hear the uh, basically the interpretive signs read off to you by uh, Bernie Weigenblast. Many of you might recognize his name. He was originally with Shadow Traffic. 
Um, we also are right in the midst of the six mile long Watchung Reservation History Trail. Uh, our mill is one of the sites where you can see this uh, sign. All of the signs along the History Trail where possible have pictures of what used to be there years ago. So we have two major events that occur each year. Uh, one occurred just two weeks ago. It is called well, Four Centuries in a Weekend. It's always the third weekend in October. In, uh, in that weekend, 35 different historic sites throughout the county are open uh, to the general public, Saturday and Sunday, noon to five. But because we are such a large site and because we have the resources of the county behind us, I'm able to bring on about 20 county staff and my Boy Scout troop as volunteers. And we have a lot of activities that we provide. Here you can see David Felt sitting right in the middle there. He looks a little bit like me. He's conducting what we call an armchair tour, where um, he explains the whole history of the village right from the front porch of the store, so you don't have to walk around. Um, inside in the general store, we have nostalgic toys for the kids to buy. We have a passport program where if you travel to multiple historic sites throughout the county, you can get your passport stamped at each site. And because we are part of the Crossroads of the American Revolution program, that entitles us to stamp national parks passports as well. We have the official stamp to do that. People travel from all over. We've had people come from Massachusetts and Maryland and Ohio just to get their passport stamped. Uh, we have a, a history trading card program throughout all of the historic sites, but uh, about five or six of the history trading cards relate to the deserted village. Um, not just kids, a lot of adults like to collect these cards and get a full set. There's over 50 cards available throughout the county. Uh, one thing that we do to try to help interpret the story of the village to children is when David Felt is, is telling his armchair tour, he tries to interact with the, with the young people, asking them questions. And if they answer correctly, he gives them money to spend in his store. So these are just wooden nickels, but they've been stamped with the, the official seal of Felt's station as well press. And they can take it inside, see the girls behind the counter and, and get a pretzel or a lollipop for it. Um, but it gets them to understand how Felt was employing people. They were working for him. He's paying them money. They're then spending the money back in his store and kept it all in-house. Uh, you see the one, um, the, the one coin that has a red apple on the back of it. That's something we instituted last year. Uh, I refer to as the Willy Wonka's golden ticket of uh, Feltville, because if you get the red apple, you can go next door to the apple and peach orchard that I showed you, where one of David Felt's farm hands helps you pick apples off the trees, and you bring it back to where the scouts are grinding up the apple cider, and you get to grind your apples into cider. Um, there's lots of activities. You can see lots of people at four centuries of the weekend, but at the left, you see the hay rides that we offer, free hay rides throughout the day. Here's the Boy Scouts grinding the apple cider. This year, they ground 20 bushels, 20 bushels of apples in uh, one weekend. Uh, we also had uh, a, a woman carding wool and spinning it into yarn. Uh, there's Sarah Felt Toby on the left, the, uh, the teacher from the one room schoolhouse. She has uh, in front of her there, you don't see it, there are little school desks and we have quill pens and, and kids can write with quill pens and little booklets that we give them. Uh, this is one of the archeologists who's been associated with the village for a number of years, Carissa Scarpa. She's standing at the house of uh, where David Felt's house once stood. The foundation was revealed a number of years ago by Montclair State University during archeological field school. And she's explaining about that. Um, there's an archaeological activity for kids to do right next to that house site. This box is full of soil and it's loaded up with 10 real artifacts and using trowels like archaeologists do, they dig in there and, and are able to find um, the artifacts and then we bury them back up again. Uh, there is a guided tour led by myself as David Felt and by one of the archaeologists and by uh, an historian who has connections to the village that date all the way back to the 1960s. She uh, is involved in rewriting a book on the village. At the cemetery, you get to meet John Wilcox, the uh, soldier who 
was in the New Jersey militia who got uh, killed during Washington's retreat from Fort Lee. He's portrayed by my brother, Tim. Um, if you come back a week later, we have Haunted Hayrides, hugely popular program. We sold out 900 tickets in 13 days, weeks before the event. Um, we do this every year. We, we won a statewide award for special event programming a number of years ago. Uh, but if you come back for that, you get to see Tim and as John Wilcox again, but the scary version of him. We have a, a couple of pine box coffins. Uh, this is in a cemetery in the dark. You, you've just taken a hay ride through the village in which David Fell told you 12 stories of mystery and tragedy, things that have occurred over the years in the village, and they've all been acted out by a cast and crew of 80 people. And then he tells you to get off the wagon and walk in the dark with a with a girl with a candle, and she's going to take you to the cemetery. Some people won't go, but it, it's really the best part of the show. Tim does a great job of relating the history, but in a fun way that, that people really get it. And that's why we do a Haunted Hayride. Um, we, we don't do it to provide entertainment. There's plenty of you know, haunted houses and haunted farms you can go to just to get scared. We do it as a way to bring people in and, and let them learn about the history of the village. Somebody in the National Park Service once told us, nothing sells history like a ghost tour, and people love it. Uh, here you see him addressing the audience. He's, he's got a great way of engaging people. Um, he's, he's got this little plastic spider that he has a piece of dental floss tied to. And the other end is tied to one of his teeth. And, and he has learned how to manipulate the floss with his tongue to make the spider climb up and go into his mouth. It just totally grosses people out. Um, some of you who uh, may be involved in stuff here in New Providence may have met him because he has been involved in some of the tercentenary um, events that went on in New Providence. Uh, over the years, there have been a number of publications this is a booklet that was printed by Dr. Arthur L. Johnson about the deserted village back in the 1940s. Uh, very basic, probably a, a rather inaccurate by today's standards. This was done in 1964. There are um, many copies of, the, of these around, but it is out of print. So if you ever get one, hang on to it. The historian who provided a lot of the material for this booklet was uh, Edwin Baldwin of Summit. His granddaughter Priscilla Hayes is the historian I mentioned before. She has taken up the mantle of trying to rewrite his book uh, to, to make it more uh, inclusive and, and get more into the social history. Um, it's become a 20 year task for her because as she says, it's like going down the rabbit hole. Every time she finds one piece of information, she gets a question that goes with it. And now she's got to pursue that question. And, and she's become frustrated with not actually getting the book out. So just last week, at the, well, two weeks ago at Four Centuries in a Weekend, she announced uh, with our support the release of the Feltville Features website. Very simply, feltvillefeatures.com. You go on there and she is starting to release the stories of Feltville as monthly blogs. Instead of waiting for the whole book to come out, you're going to be able to read a chapter every month. And you can go on there now. It's already got the first few entries on there. The uh, deserted village, as you're hearing, is not so deserted. Uh, we're getting about 150,000 visitors a year. This is just this past weekend. Spring and fall are the busiest, uh, particularly the fall when the fall color is out. Everybody's coming out to see the leaves. Um, you see people strolling the grounds, uh, jogging. We've got people out there jogging from six in the morning till nine at night. We even had one guy used to come and play his bagpipes in the parking lot because his wife wouldn't let him play at home. Dog walking is huge. We've got plenty of that. Photography, um, professional photographers are there every week, you know, doing portraits of families. Um, as we get closer to Christmas, we'll see a lot of, you know, future Christmas cards being photographed there. Uh, but for our four centuries in a weekend, and then again, right before Christmas, we have what we call the Kodak spot here on the side porch of the church store building. Uh, during four centuries in a weekend, we actually provide a staff member to be there both of those two days to take the picture of your family so that everybody can be in the picture. Speaking of which, um, here, here's a little blurb about ecotourism. We're finding that 
uh, a historic site like the deserted village is good not just for the site, it's also good for the surrounding community. People come from all over and particularly being located where we are just off of an interstate highway, the license plates that I see in a parking lot are incredible. They're, they're, they are from all over states throughout the United States. There was a, a truck there one day with Texas license plates and a lady happened to be sitting in the truck. So I said, can you tell me what brought you here from Texas? She said, well, actually it's a rental truck. We're not from Texas. We're from Minnesota. And we're on our way to Newark Airport and we have two hours to, to spend before we have to be at the airport and we'd rather spend it here than in the airport. Um, so ecotourism is a huge thing. While they're in the area, they're buying gas, they're going to restaurants, they're using convenience stores. Um, this family is here from Georgia, uh, except the lady in the, the back left, that happens to be my wife. And that is her mother, sister, and brother who were here this past weekend for my stepdaughter's wedding in Masker's Barn. Um, but again, people coming from all over. At Four Centuries in a Weekend, two weeks ago, we had people here from Texas, we had them from Massachusetts, we had them from uh, points far and wide. So rounding up, um, the deserted village is, is a very busy place. It is not at all deserted, not just because my family still lives there, but because there are people of all types coming for all kinds of activities. And I would invite you to be some of those people. If you don't have a chance to get down there often, come check it out at least once. Uh, if you are not able to get down the hill or worse yet, you know you're not gonna get back up that hill because it is a, a hill. Um, if you've got a handicap plate or a handicap hang tag, come on down anyway. Uh, if I'm around, I always tell people, you know, if, if you've got a handicap, please feel free to, to come through. At events like our four centuries in a weekend, we provide transportation between the, hay, the uh, hayride and golf carts that we take people around on. We are cognizant of the, the difficulties of the topography. But once you get down as far as my house, it's pretty much flat ground and you'll be able to get around and, and, and see everything that's there. So with that, I will open the floor to any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, this is fabulous. I just love this talk and everything you've been doing. And you know, I have to tell you, I came to this area in, uh, I hate to admit it, in 1969 to take a job at Bell Labs up the hill from Feltville. And so ever since then, I've been hiking in the Wachung Reservation and cross-country skiing in the winter at the Audi Club and so on. And, you know, I'd come across this mysterious place, this deserted village. It was like 15 years before you moved in. I don't think any restoration had been done yet. And there weren't very many signs. So it really felt deserted. And I and it was before the before Google and the internet. So I couldn't Google it to find any, out anything about it. So I fantasized that it's called Feltville because they used felt there and they made felt hats. And, and that, of course, conjured up the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland, which all kind of percolated in my mind. So I always love Feltville. And it, it's become so much now. So I, I just have two, two questions for you. Take them if you want to or move on. But just a practical historical one here's a factory out in the wilderness so how how did uh, david felt get his materials to the factory and ship his goods back and, and if you go into murray hill station i don't know if there was a train already but that's up the hill and down the other side that's impractical and the, the other question is practical one for ogard suppose ogard wanted to have a function at the barn what would what would be what would we have to do to make that happen? Okay, two very good questions. Answering the first, uh, as far as transportation, I, I showed you in one of the aerial views. You saw the factory and you saw a garage next to it. It was a three bay garage that housed Conestoga wagons, big, sturdy wagons like the ones that went out to the far west, pulled by oxen because you're loading basically paper products, very heavy. You put it in these wagons, and there was a long circuitous route that they took. They, they couldn't come straight up the side of the mountain like Ackerman's cattle. He built that road because cattle could go up and down by themselves. But instead, there was a long route that went out past, if any of you have ever been to Hermit's Pond or Salamander Pond, that road came out around that way, brought you up into what is now the village on Cataract Hollow Road, up to Buttonwood Road, which was Glenside Avenue, and that would take you off to New York City. Or you could go out the other way, 
stay down in the valley and take it out to the far end of what is now the, the, the end of the park through the valley onto um, uh, Skytop Drive, which becomes Valley Road and continues out towards Wachung. All right, the road through the valley was Valley Road. But you would turn and take it down towards Scotch Plains, join up with the Swiss Shore Stage Route, which would then take you down to Philadelphia and on to New Orleans, where David Felt had a business dealings through a store in, in New Orleans. Um, so that, that's how they transported things. Uh, if the old guard wanted to rent the, uh, the Masters Barn for any event, you are quite encouraged to do that. There's an online application. You just go to the uh, Deserted Village page on the county website. There's a tab for Masters Barn. Towards the bottom is uh, a link to click an online application. The, right now, uh, we lowered our limits during COVID and we are keeping them lower out of respect to the historic nature of the building. For a while there, it felt like we were kind of cramming a few too many people in there. So right now our limit is 12 tables of eight, so 96 people. If you are not using tables to seat everybody, you can get away with a little bit more than that. Um, we do have all the furniture. We have round tables for seating. We have rectangular tables for food and drinks and everything else. We have cocktail tables and um, the, the cost is very inexpensive. Uh, for any of you as your family, you can rent the, uh, the barn for a day as a county resident for $350. Uh, you can do two days for $650, which is often what happens with something like a wedding. Uh, Nonprofit groups are charged even less. And uh, the only downside is it's extremely popular. There are no dates left in this year. Half of 2023 is already booked and we already have a number of dates gone in 2024. So if you ever do wanna do something, plan early and secure a date right away. You can secure a date without putting down any money. Then our reservationist will give you my phone number, tell you to come and, and do a tour with me. I'll give you the grand tour, show you what you can do, what you can't do. And then if everything you know works for you, then you, you make payment on your, your date. But as long as your application is in, if that date is not already taken by somebody else, we, we will hold that date for you for a while. You hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, my question is, uh, first of all, that I when I first moved here, somebody told me there was just a bunch of rundown buildings there and it wasn't worth seeing. So I'm glad to see that you've done all that work and, and uh, it's now available. And you mentioned that uh, sometimes teenagers will come at like 12 midnight to do whatever. Uh, but what are the official hours of operation and days are you closed, uh, et cetera? We are open um, all day long. There, there's no official hours for strolling the grounds. What we do limit is the parking. So you cannot be parked in the parking lot between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. That's the limiting factor. If anybody's there after nine o'clock, uh, we'll, I'll either look for them and chase them out, or if I can't find them, then the county police will come and usually issue them a ticket and then go looking for them. Thank you. Anyone else here? Mitch? Hey, Dan. Uh, Delt Hill was, was uh, founded based on the water power that was produced from the Delt Hill and the Rupert. Uh, somewhere in the middle of this history, steam came along uh, and, and supplanted that the water power industry. Did that fact we ever convert over to steam or, or stay with water? So the question is, uh, did the factory ever convert from water power to steam power? Uh, not that I am aware of. I do know, however, that in the resort period, out at... Um, what is variously known as Salamander Pond or Hermit's Pond. Hermit's Pond being really the more appropriate term because there was a person who lived in a house right out near that pond, a, a distance out from the village, and he was by himself, so he was the hermit. But his job was to run the steam pump in the, in the brick building right alongside of that um, impoundment that was formed right in front of the spring because that became the drinking water for the resort. Um, they would pump the water up from there 
to a, um, an underground reservoir, and it, it would then flow back by gravity to the houses. When I moved in, that was still the same basic system we were using, <laughs> except that the, the uh, source of water had been switched over to a, a well that was down along the brook. But we were still using water from that underground reservoir. Um, we were losing about 15,000 gallons of water a week. Um, so obviously there were a lot of leaks in the, in the reservoir underground. And I would have to run the pump every Sunday for 12 hours and go out in between and dump a quart of Clorox bleach in. That's how we chlorinated our water. We tested it every month. It failed about one out of every three tests. My late wife got E. coli once um, and a few other problems. Um, but we, uh, we converted to city water um, as we developed the plans, knowing we would need a, a much better source of water, um, not for the residents, but for the visitors and for fire protection. Is Hermit's Pond upstream from uh, Lake Surprise? Hermit's Pond is downstream from Lake Surprise. Not as far as Sealy's. Correct, not as far as Sealy's. It's... Um, if you if you went out past Masker's Barn, continue straight on that trail, it would take you right to it, maybe a quarter of a mile out. Stan, thank you. A fascinating presentation. And I have to admit, I didn't get to uh, visit there until maybe a year or so ago, even though I was you know, pretty much born in New Providence and you know been there most of my life. It's a fascinating place. I encourage our members to visit. I'm curious, I don't think you mentioned, what was the largest number of buildings on the site you know, at any one time and, you know, how many are still standing today? And then are there plans over the next many, many years to try to rehab, you know, uh, as many of the buildings as possible and even rebuild some of the original ones that had burned down or decayed, et cetera? Okay, it's, it's thought that David Felt had 22 buildings, 11 of which were houses and the other 11 were um, public purpose buildings, the general store and church, a uh, blacksmith shop, the school, um, and, and uh, farm buildings. Uh, today, there are 10 buildings. Eight of them are houses uh, that felt built. One is the general store and church, and one is the master's barn, which was the carriage house that Ackerman built. The, uh, the master plan calls for restoration of every building. Um, the general store and church was restored in 1998, master's barn 2011. My house has been under restoration since the day I moved in. Um, I, I just finished the last bedroom last year and now have to start over with all the rooms that we have done. Um, but yes, the plan calls for as, as time and money allow to restore everything. Um, the firm that we hired to do the master plan back in 1985 was from Manhattan. And they, those architects were just amazed that they could drive 16 miles from New York City to the deserted village and be in a whole different world. And they thought how great this would be to restore every building and rebuild every missing building, particularly the mill, because that could be a 22 unit apartment house. Everybody could live there and go to New York for, to, to work. And we said, that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> we're looking to restore the village as it was. And in, in historic preservation, uh, a very basic principle today is that you don't rebuild missing buildings because you don't want to give the misimpression that that building is the original building. You can interpret it through uh, photographs. You can interpret it through an outline on the ground. Uh, if anybody's ever been to Franklin Court in Pennsylvania, they interpret it by building a steel frame that approximates the size and shape of the house, but you know that that's obviously not his house. So that, that is our plan. Thank you, Dean. Yes, thank you for the talk. Prior to Feltville, was there a presence of Native American Indians living in that area? Okay, so the question is, prior to Feltville, were there any Native Americans in the area? Um, my, my bachelor's degree is in anthropology slash archaeology from Seton Hall University. I did some graduate work uh, at NYU. Um, while at Seton Hall, I was involved in archaeological explorations for the environmental impact statement for the construction of Interstate Route 78. We were specifically tasked with looking for Native American artifacts and settlements. And we found one artifact uh, after looking at five different possible routes of the uh, highway five miles long. So basically, 
at, at any one time, there were no more than 10,000 Native Americans in New Jersey. If you had a choice between living up along the Delaware River with its fertile uh, fields um, along the edges and with all of the fish and shellfish and the ability to, to travel up and down in canoes versus living in what is now Union County, um, the choice was easy. You, you lived up there. So we had trails like the Oaxaca Trail that passed through. There were certainly Native Americans passing through, but there doesn't seem to have been a lot of settlement in the area. Thank you so much. Online, George Paul. Yeah, great talk. Very interesting. What caught Thank my you. attention was the uh, archaeological digs. Uh, my son, when he bought a house up in uh, Vermont, uh, it had a stone wall and he was moving the stone wall and underneath he found uh, a lot of uh, Revolutionary War artifacts. Um, are there active digs at the site? And if so, is is who's managing them and, and what are they, you know, are they permanent dig okay. sites? We, um, two things. First of all, we, we have three archaeologists involved in various ways at the Deserta Village in what we uh, refer to as the Felt Hill Archaeology Project. It started with eight summers of archaeological field schools conducted by Montclair State University back in the 1990s um, that led to things like finding the foundation of David Felt's house. Uh, and also some interesting stuff about social history uh, from one end of the village to the other, how there were differences, particularly in the summer resort period. Um, there have been archaeological excavations. There needs to be archaeological excavations anytime you are going to disturb the soil in uh, a, a National Register listed site uh, prior to restoration work. So. For instance, before the church store could be restored, there was archaeological work around that. Same thing at Masker's Barn. Um, there is no active archaeology going on now because there is no um, major project underway. But the project that we did just do, the $900,000 for the two exterior restorations, that project included running electricity into one of those houses to be able to do some climate control and just to dig a, a trench from a pull box to the foundation of the house, we did have archeologists having to stand by to monitor that excavation. The other thing that I, I didn't mention in the talk, but um, it kind of segues in here, for many years, we ran a program called Operation Archeology. span It was a program for fifth grade students from schools throughout Union County. Students would come up there 125 at a time. We had a site out in a field where we we actually built house foundations for a, a house, a church, a farm. Um, we had a well, and we would fill them with hundreds of real artifacts, things that we had obtained like from garage sales. They weren't artifacts native to uh, the deserted village, but they were real things, you know, silverware and ceramics, bones, and we'd bury them a foot deep. And then the students would spend two days digging it up under the uh, supervision of real archaeologists. They learned all the techniques. And then on the third day, they would all get together and talk about what they found in their unit compared to the unit next to them and the unit next to them. And the students would basically compare notes and try to determine what happened to this lost village. It was a great program. Uh, we were doing it three times each spring and each summer. So a lot of students went through it over the years. But unfortunately, it became a problem for the schools. Um, more so about busing than about the cost of the of the uh, tuition. It, it was just very hard to get school buses at the right times to get the students up there to be able to spend the whole day and then to get bused back to their school on time for the end of the day without the buses having to be off picking up or delivering students. Mm. We have time for two last quick Thank questions. You. I uh, was a longtime resident of Union County. My whole life, I overheard about the about, about the hold it closer oh, about the deserted village and the reason it was deserted it was murders in the deserted village to this day people tell me about the murders in the deserted village okay 
there, there are lots of stories that are just stories uh, compounded by a magazine called Weird New Jersey, if anybody has ever seen that. Every time Weird New Jersey comes out with a new issue, I know that I'm going to have a lot more kids that night to chase out. And they're not just kids, they're adults too. Um, sometimes paranormals, you know, everybody thinks this is the, the place to see some great hauntings. I've lived there 30 years. I haven't seen a ghost yet. I haven't seen a witch. Um, I, I read the stories in Weird New Jersey and I can read into them where people's recollections from their youth 30, 40, 50 years ago are kind of garbled. And, and what they're saying they did is physically impossible. You can't get from here to there, that kind of thing. And I know it's all been, been kind of uh, exaggerated in their minds, but what I see happening so often, like the five kids that I chased out last night with their Halloween masks on, is they come to the deserted village to scare each other. And th th there are no real ghosts or, or goblins or witches or whatever, it's them scaring each other. As far as murders, um, we have had a number of deaths in the village, as you would expect, you know, a place that had 175 people living in it, people died. We have a cemetery. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone having been murdered. Um, we, we have two girls who were 16 years old, um, worked for David Felt in his mill. They both went swimming, and in spite of being excellent swimmers, they both drowned. David Felt had them buried in the cemetery. Um, if you come to the haunted hayride, you may get to meet them, but, um, but they were not murdered. Um, John Wilcox, the, the uh, Revolutionary War soldier, he was killed in battle, but that's battle, that's not murder. Um, there, there was Mrs. Kuffner, who lived in house number nine, elderly woman, uh, her house caught on fire, 1953, she was blind, she was home alone, her husband was out, he comes home, finds the house on fire, she's screaming from an upstairs window, he tries to get in, the flames beat him back, two passing employees from Bell Labs grab him and pull him back from the burning doorway, she died in the fire. So there, there have been a lot of tragedies there, but no murders. Paul. Yeah, Dan, since you, since you brought up uh, the topic of Route 78, you mentioned it in passing. Uh, I, I'll say I, I was there at Bell Labs before anything was, any of that was built through the edge of the reservation and it was in its planning stage and I'm aware of all the public controversy and so on and so forth. And then they finally did all of that regrading to put that through and they put in this highway going right alongside of the, of the Watchtown Reservation. And it was so heartbreaking to see the impact on the reservation. So there's continual traffic. There was all the mud run off into the reservation. It was terrible impact. <laughs> so what was, well, what's your take on all of that? I mean, obviously we have to live with it. It's done, but what's your take on that? When I went from being the museum curator at Trailside to being the park planner for the park system, the very first job I was assigned to was the construction of Route 78. They, um, the New Jersey Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration had established a, um, a, a series of biweekly meetings of people from their staffs, from their environmental branches, and from county parks, and I was a representative to that. Um, and our job was to make sure that all of the environmental controls that were designed got built. Things as, as simple as every sign, uh, like stop signs, the backs of them are all painted so that if you're in the park looking out, you don't see them. They, they took every, every possible step to try to minimize the damage. But some things, they didn't uh, have the, the technology or the design for at that time that we have today. The biggest impact, which you mentioned, is erosion. There is a lot of water that comes off that highway. It runs through three settling basins, but it just runs through those basins and comes hurtling down into the reservation, causing some significant erosion. The, um, when, when the church store building was going to be restored and we did archeology span work there, the archeologists found that there was two feet of sediment deposited at the front of that building. That although the porch now is almost at ground level, that in, when it was originally built, you had to go up a flight of stairs to get into the building but the ground has risen by two feet. And that most of that was before Route 78. It's just being on the side of the hill, things move downhill, the water moves it. Um, but, but where the water is coming off of the, off of the highway, 
yeah, the erosion is pretty uh, impactful. There's one particular spot right below the McMain traffic light where uh, the structures that they built have collapsed since then. They had to rebuild it. They put in some things that are called energy attenuation devices, which look like jacks, like kids' jacks, but they're you know huge, made out of concrete to try to slow the water down. We recently had an Eagle Scout project who had to build a staircase uh, on either side of the ravine for people who are hiking what is a very popular trail there. It's both the Sierra Trail and the, and the uh, Watch Organization History Trail. And you used to be able to just walk across this stream. Now it got to a point where somebody brought a ladder out there and you had to go down a ladder and back up the other side. So we had to adapt to that with a staircase. So that, that was probably the greatest impact. Uh, the other impact is the noise. You know, I, I'm fr I grew up in Elizabeth, not that I'm a stranger to noise, but you know, I, I lay in bed and I can hear traffic on the highway. It's not what we would want to hear in the Wachung Reservation, let alone in a historic site. There is a, uh, a silver lining to everything. That highway will bring us visitors from all over America. And, and you know, that hopefully will at, at some point help to fund the restoration of the rest of the buildings if we get to a point where we can start charging uh, entrance fees or, or even just the people who are coming to events at the barn. 10,000 people a year sit in chairs in Masters Barn for some party and go away having spent a day in a historic site and take some of that knowledge with them. And th that has been our strategy from the be beginning to, to restore the two major public buildings and build advocacy to get people to say, this is a really a cool place and hopefully go back and tell the county commissioners, this is a great place that you should be investing money in. If you're a county commissioner, you got a tough job. Do I spend money on roads? bridges, the jail, uh, social services, parks, historic sites, you got to decide where to put that money. And if, if the uh, voters are telling you, hey, we really enjoy this, this historic site, please put more money there, that helps them. So the more we can get people to tell them that message, the advocacy is, is so important. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Your 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 knowledge of the uh, deserted village is extraordinary, and we are very fortunate to have you there. And now, uh, Terry Dwyer will be providing the formal thank you for the old guard. Yeah, Dan. Briefly, I just want to present you with a certificate from the old guard of Summit. Certificate of appreciation. Has the orchid which is the symbol that was adopted by the uh, Summit Old Guard back in 1930, when Summit was renowned for its uh, orchid production and distribution. Uh, but it also reminds us of the original mission of uh, the Summit Old Guard for friendship and fellowship. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, and thank you again for inviting me today.